Good morning and welcome to Mathematics, with Ar Mathematics for Architects. My name is Neil Kors and I'm going to be teaching mathematics to you this semester. Today I'm going to start by giving some information about this course and then we'll cover the first three topics. We'll talk about sets, about symbolic logic, and we'll talk about numbers. How about now? Can you hear me now? Okay, let me start again. Welcome to Mathematics for Architects. My name is Neil Kors and I'm going to be teaching mathematics to you this semester. Today I'm going to start by giving some information about this course and then we'll cover three topics. We'll talk about sets, about symbolic logic, and about numbers. I'm expecting to give approximately 12 lectures to you, and they'll be every Friday morning um, between nine and 11. And my plan is for the first 60 minutes, I will teach to you. And then after that, I'll be available to answer your questions. I say approximately 60 minutes. Sometimes it will be a little bit longer, sometimes it might be a little bit less. We don't have to use the whole two hours if we don't want to. If we don't have an hour's worth of questions, then it's okay for us to finish early. Some weeks I might lecture for a little bit more than 60 minutes, some weeks I might lecture for less than 60 minutes, but I'm going to try to um, spread my material over 60 minutes. We're going to, I'm going to break the material in this course up into four parts. We're, we're going to start with an introduction. We'll talk about sets, symbolic logic, numbers, and Cartesian coordinates. Hopefully, everything or most of the first section will be revision for you nice easy start for you hopefully part two of this course is about the geometry of space we will talk about polar coordinates conic sections three-dimensional cartesian coordinates and then vectors the dot product the cross product lines planes and projections part Pre of this course is about finite mathematics. We're going to cover combinatorics, that means counting, probability, and graph theory. And then at the end of the course, we're going to study calculus, limits, continuity, differentiation, and integration. And I'm intending to break the course up like this. First two weeks, we will cover the introduction. We'll do three weeks of geometry, three weeks of finite mathematics, and then four weeks of calculus. I have lecture notes for this course. You can find them through the OLearn contact area. They're there if you want to, if you want to read ahead of the lessons or read later. Completely up to you. I'm going to examine, I'm going to assess this course with exams and homeworks, but let me give you the disclaimer that everything on this slide might change depending on decisions of the people running the university. At the moment, my intention is that we'll split the course up into as 20% for homework, 20% for a midterm exam, and 60% for the final exam. But depending on the decisions of the university, for example, maybe we'll need to make the final exam 70%, and then the other two will become 50. 
I will tell you later after the university makes its decisions. For the homework, I'm going to give weekly multiple choice tests through OLAN. Each test will be available to you for seven days and the first one will open next week. So that means starting next week, you can start working on it and then the deadline will be seven days after that. The midterm exam, which will be in either week eight or week nine, will be an online exam using OLAN. I'll give details later. The final exam, at the moment, we don't know what we're doing. It might be an online exam. It might be um, an exam done in the classroom. The university will make its decisions later. If I was teaching this course to you in a classroom, then you would be expected to study one or two hours outside of class for every hour of lecture. So if this was a classroom course, I would be teaching for four hours and then you would be expected to study another four to eight hours outside of class. Because this is an online course, we're only going to have two hours of lectures officially each week, but you're still expected to study between eight and 12 hours each week. So your study outside of the lesson should be somewhere between six and 10 hours. Just a, use this as a guide. I'm not going to tell you how to study, but I'm going to give you some suggestions. The, there will be homework tests each week. I try to make these quite easy, certainly easier than the exam questions, so that you can follow the course and check that you're learning that week's material. These lessons are being recorded. You can re-watch them whenever you want. They will be available on both OLEARN and on YouTube. There are lecture notes which you can read before or after the lecture and these slides I'm making available to you through OLEARN as well. The lecture notes have lots of exercises in them which you can use to study and most of the exercises have solutions in the back so you can test yourself to see if your answer is correct. Through OLEARN we have a discussion board which you can use to ask questions to me or to other students. If you have questions to ask to me, you can either ask them during at the end of the lesson or via email or via the discussion board. If your question is not urgent and it's not private, I suggest you don't use email, rather you use the discussion board because other students might be interested in the answer that I give to you, or other students might answer your questions before I see it and answer it for you. You could use your time reading maths books. I'm going to suggest a couple. Or you might use your time watching videos from other lectures. For example, there is a guy called Black Pen, Red Pen on YouTube, who has some good calculus videos, which you might find useful. Two good books for this course. For geometry and for calculus, a book called Thomas's Calculus is a very good book. All the engineering students at our university are forced to buy this book their maths courses. Second good book which covers geometry and finite math and calculus is College Mathematics for Business, Economics, Life Sciences and Social Sciences. These are not required purchases, you don't have to buy these books, but you might find it useful to, to find a copy of them. You may have noticed already the bottom corner of the, of the screen is a slide number. This will give you an idea of roughly how close to the end of the lesson we are. And if you're following along in the lecture notes, the current chapter in the lecture notes is written at the top.
chapter one is about sets. Hopefully you've studied this at high school, so hopefully this will be revision for you. A set is just a collection of objects which we specify in such a way that we always know if an object is in the collection or is not in the collection. For example, the set one, so the collection of one, two, three, four, and five is a set. We use these curly brackets of the left and the right to contain the set. And we can name a set, the set I can call set A. Or another example, the set B is the set containing apple, banana, or cherry. Or the set C contains the letters N, E, I, and L. We can put any objects in a set as long as it's clear if an object is in the set or is not in the set. This symbol, this symbol which looks a little bit like an E, means it's in the set. So, for example, if B is the set, apple, banana, cherry, then we can say that banana is in the set B, but date is not in the set B. This E with a line for it means is not in the set. Every object in a set is called an element of the set. We could have a set which doesn't contain any elements. This is called the empty set. And for the empty set, we use the notation a zero with a line for it, a circle with a line for it. This symbol, this vertical line, means such that. So, for example, if I had the set of all x such that x is a weekend day, then this will be the set containing Saturday and Sunday. Or if I had the set of all numbers x such that x squared is equal to 4, this would be the set containing minus 2 and 2 because minus 2 squared is equal to 4 and 2 squared is equal to 4. Or if I had the set of all the people who are more than 5 meters tall, we know that nobody is more than 5 meters tall, so this is the empty set. If every element of a set A is also in another set B, then we say that A is a subset of B, and we write it like this. A is a subset of B. For example, look at the sets 1, 2, 3, and 1, 2, 3, 4. The number 1 is in the set on the right, the number 2 is in the set on the right, and the number 3 is in the set on the right. So we can say that the set 1, 2, 3 is a subset of the set 1, 2, 3, 4. Second line, banana is in the set apple, banana, cherry. So the set containing banana is in apple, banana, cherry. Or names of the teachers of the, this course and its Turkish equivalent. Neil is in the set containing Neil and Sezgin. Sezgin is in the set containing Neil and Sezgin. So the set Neil Sezgin is a subset of the set Neil Sezgin. These two sets are, of course, equal, but that's what this horizontal line at the bottom means. The universal set is the set of all elements under consideration. We call this the set U. So, for example, if this rectangle is the set U, this is the set of everything that we're, we're thinking about, we might consider two subsets, a subset A inside U and a subset B inside U. And we might want to combine A and B in different ways. For example, we might be interested in everything which is in A and everything which is in B, all of this blue shaded area. This is called the union of A and B, and we write A, um, this U symbol, and B. Or alternatively, 
we might be interested in the elements which are in both A and B, the elements which are in A and in B. This is called the intersection of A and B, and we use this notation A upside down U B. For example, if I have two sets, A, B, C, and B, C, D, and suppose I want to take the union of these two sets, I want the set which contains every element which is in either one of these sets. I have an A, a B, and a C, B and a C I've already counted, and then a D. The union of these two sets is A, B, C, D. <coughs> Or I might be interested in the intersection of these two sets, the elements which are in both sets. A is not in the right set, so we discard A. B is in both sets, so we use B. C is in both sets, so we use C. D is not in the left set. The intersection of these two sets is the set containing B and C. We might be interested in the complement of A. If A is this circle, and this rectangle is the universal set U, that's everything that we're thinking about on, on, the, on whichever topic we're thinking about. Complement of A is every element which is in U, but which is not in A. And we write A and then a little c. For example, if U is the set of numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and if A is the set of odd numbers in U, then the complement of A, and that's every element in U which is not in A, so not 1, not 3, not 5, not 7, and not 9, because these are all in A, which numbers are we left with? we're left with 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. So the complement of A is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. We're going to need this notation later, particularly when we do probability, but also when we do calculus. Chapter two is about symbolic logic. A proposition is a statement which is either true or false, but not both. For example, the statement grass is green. This is a proposition because this might be true or this might be false. In this case, this is true. The statement 2 plus 5 equal to 5. This is a proposition. We could, I could ask you, is this true or false? and the answer is false. Or the statement, my name is Neil, for me this statement is true. These three are propositions. But if I said close the door, is this true or false? You can't answer that, this is not a proposition. Is it cold today? This is not a proposition, this is a question. We can't say that this statement is true or the statement is false. And one is not a proposition. One is not true, one is not false. One is just a number. The symbol for or is this type of V. So for example, if P is the proposition, it is snowing today, and Q is the proposition, it is raining today, then P or Q is the proposition, it is snowing or raining today. Or another example, if M is the proposition, X is an element of A, X is in the set A, and if N is the proposition, X is in the set B, then M or N, X is in A, or X is in B, 
is the same as saying x is in a union b. And if you're struggling to remember which notation is which, remember that this v looks a little bit like this u. We can understand or using a truth table. In this table, I'm using capital T for true and capital F for false. Let's look at the first line. If P is true and Q is true, we can ask, is P or Q true? And the answer is yes. P is true or Q is true. This whole statement is true. We might look at the second line. P is true and Q is false. Is P or Q true? Is P true or is Q true? And the answer is yes, P is true. So therefore P or Q must also be true. The first line is similar. Is P true or is Q true? The answer is yes. Q is true, so P or Q is true. And then finally, if P is false and Q is false, P or Q must also be false. Next symbol. The symbol for and is this upside down V. Similar symbol to or, but upside down. So, for example, if P is the, the proposition, I am hungry, and Q is the proposition, I am sleepy, then P and Q is the proposition, I am hungry and sleepy. Or using sets, M is the proposition, X is in the set A, and N is the proposition, X is in the set B. M and n, we need both of these to be true. We need x is in a and x is in b. This is the same as saying that x is in a intersection b. And again, this upside down v and we have an upside down u. You can remember which which symbol is and and which symbol is or if you remember intersection and union. A truth table for and. Is P true and is Q true? For the first line, yes. P is true and Q is true, therefore P and Q is true. Second line. Is P true and is Q true? No, because Q is not true, so P and Q must be false. Likewise for line three, is P and Q true? No, false. True or false, P and Q are both true, false. Moving on to another symbol, this corner, not quite a minor sign because it has a little part on the right, means not. So for example, if P is the statement, your teacher likes coffee, then not P is the statement, your teacher does not like coffee. Or using some, uh, some um, inequalities, if M is the proposition X is greater than or equal to seven, not M is the opposite. Opposite of greater than, than or equal to seven is strictly less than seven. The truth table for not is very simple. If P is true, then not P is false. And not P is the opposite, so not P must be true. The symbol for if and only if and 
in maths we have a short way of writing if and only if we take if if from the front and then the final f and we write iff this iff you won't find in an english dictionary but this is a, this is a word which mathematicians use a lot when they write in english mathematical english but not general english the symbol for if and only if is this double ended double arrow. Let's look at a truth table for if and only if. If and only if means P and Q must be the same. P is true if and only if Q is true. We look at the first line, are P and Q the same? Yes, they're both true, therefore P if and only Q is true. For the second line, are P and Q the same? The answer is no. P is true, but Q is false, so they're different. P if and only Q must be false. The same for the third line, are P and Q the same? No, so P if and only Q is false. Fourth line, are P and Q both the same? The answer is yes, so P if and only Q is true. The symbol for implies is this single ended double arrow. This means if P is Q, if I write P implies Q, it means if P is true, then Q must also be true. So, for example, London is a city in the UK. So, if P is I am in London and Q is I am in K, then P implies Q. If I'm in London, then I must also be in the UK. So, P implies Q is true. Truth table of this. Oh, often confuses people at first so let me go slowly first line is straightforward if p is q then q is true we have true and true so this must be true second line people are usually happy with if p is true then q is true this is not correct for this line we have P true but Q false, so P implies Q must be false. The key part to remember is implies means if P is true, then Q is true. So we're only interested in what happens if P is true. So if P is false, we don't care about Q. If P is false and Q is true, that's okay, that can be true, we don't care about Q. If P is false and Q is false, again, that's fine, we don't care. Let's use this London and the UK example to understand this truth. Today. First line, true, true, I am in London and I'm in the UK. I'm in, in London implies I'm in the UK. Yes, but I'm happy with that. For the second line, is it possible that I'm in London, but I'm not in the UK? No, this is not possible. If I'm in London, then I must also be in the UK. So the second line must be false. Third line, is it possible that I'm not in London, but I am in the UK? And yes, this is possible. There's lots of cities in the UK. Perhaps I'm in one of the other cities. It's possible to be in the UK, but not to be in London. And the final line, is it possible that I'm not in London and I'm not in the UK? Yes, I might be in Istanbul, then I'm not in London, I'm not in the UK. It's possible for P to be false and Q to be false. So P implies Q, 
must be true. Let me just give you a warning before we go on. When we write P implies Q, both P and Q must be propositions. So that means this line is wrong. The first part is correct. This is a proposition. The, the integral from 0 to 1 of 3x squared dx is equal to x cubed evaluated at 1 and 0. This is a true proposition. However, 1 is not a proposition. So we can't write implies here. The correct, the correct way to write this equation would be instead of writing implies here, we would we want to write equals. And then it becomes a correct statement. And let me remark that if P and Q are propositions, then P or Q, P and Q, not P, P implies Q, and P if and only if Q are also propositions. We can say whether each of these is true or false as long as P and Q are propositions. The converse of P implies Q is Q implies P. If anybody says converse to you, it means switch the positions of P and Q. There's a similar word, the contrapositive of P implies Q is not Q implies not P. So this time we're not only switching positions of p and q but we also are putting not in front of them so for example if p is it is raining and q is i get wet p implies q if p is true then q is true means if it is raining then i get wet the converse is if I get wet, then it is rain. And the contrapositive is if I do not get wet, then it is not rain. I'm going to run through some identities using symbolic logic notation. First ones of these are quite straightforward, but as we get to the end of the list, I'm going to, I'm going to need to explain them in more detail. First line, P or P. Is P true or is P true? This is true if P is true and it's false if P is false. So this is the same as saying P. Likewise, P and P. Is P true and is P true? is the same as saying is p true we, the order we write p and q doesn't matter is p true or is q true the same as saying is q true or is p true and we could have the same line but with and instead of or um if we have numbers, let's suppose I did something like a plus b multiplied by c, we know that this is the same as a multiplied by c plus b multiplied by c. And we have exactly the same idea for symbolic logic. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. This will give us 9 and 10. P and Q or R is the same as P and Q or P and R. And P or Q and R is the same as P or Q and P or R. If 
4, 5, and 6, P or Q or R. If we still thought about numbers, A plus B and then plus C, we know is the same as A plus B plus C. Doesn't matter which order we add numbers together, and the same is true for or and. For seven and eight, we can take a not symbol inside a bracket, not P or Q, so it's not P, and we get not Q, but we have to change the symbol. Or becomes and, or and becomes or. Not P or Q is the same as not P and not Q. Statement 11, P or true. P is true or true is true. But true is always true. This statement must always be true. Likewise, P and false. P is true and false is true. But no, false is never true. False is always false. This statement must be false. P or false. P is true or false is true. False is never true, so we might ignore this part and we just have P. P and true. True is always true. So and true is always true. P and true is the same as P. Number 15. P is true or not P is true. Well, if P is true, then not P is false. So the whole statement is true. If P is false, then not P is true. And the whole statement is true. Doesn't matter if P is true or false, the statement is always true. Line 16 P is true and not P is true. This is not possible. Either P is true and not P is false, or vice versa. P is false and not P is true. This line must always be false. Line 17, not not, if I said minus minus 3, write that equal to 3, we would understand. Likewise, not not P is the same as P. And this is where it starts to get a little bit more complicated. The last five are not obvious, perhaps. P implies Q is the same as not P or Q. I'm going to discuss this soon. P if and only if Q is the same as P implies Q and Q implies P. This makes sense in terms of the notation. This looks like an arrow which points from P to Q and an arrow which points from Q to P. So this makes sense just in terms of notation that this means P implies Q and Q implies P. Line 20, P and Q implies R is the same as P implies Q implies R. Not, perhaps not obvious. Line 21, P implies Q and P implies not Q is the same as not P. Line 20, P implies Q is the same as it's contrapositive, not Q implies not P. These are not necessarily obvious, so I want to use a truth table to prove that these are true. I have a large table here. On the left, I have all the possibilities for P and Q. Either true, 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 false, false, true, or false, false. This is all the possibilities.
P is true or false, two possibilities. Q is true or false, there are two possibilities. And two multiplied by two is four. And we need four lines in our table. If, for example, we had, we were doing a bigger truth table with P, Q, and R, each one of these could be true or false. We'd have two multiplied by two multiplied by two is eight. We would need to do a truth table with eight lines. I'm writing down P implies Q, I'm writing down not P, and I'm writing, not, I'm writing down Q, and then finally, I'm writing not P or Q. P implies Q, we've already done this. If you look back on a previous slide or a previous page of, of your lecture notes, you'll see this column must be true, false, true, true. Not P is always the opposite of P. P goes true, true, false, false. So not P must be the opposite, false, false, true, true. Likewise, I already have Q. Q and Q are the same, true, false, true, false. Now I only want to look at <coughs> the right side of the table. First line, false and true. False or true is true. Second line is false, false. We have false or false, which is false. Line three, true, true. True or true is true. And then in the bottom line, true or false is true. I've put in all of the possibilities. Now let's look at the third column and the final column. Third column says true, false, true, true. And the sixth column also says true, false, true, true. These two columns are the same. <coughs> Always exactly the same, no matter what P and what Q are. Because these are the same, these two properties must be logically equivalent. In other words, P implies Q is the same as not P or Q. This proves identity 18. We can use the same method to prove identity 22. Identity 22 said that P implies Q is the same as not Q implies not P. In other words, P implies Q is the same as its contrapositive. You can fill in a table as before. Start with all of the possibilities of P and Q. Write down P implies Q. Write down not Q and not P. And then Looking at just looking at the right side, does false imply false? Is that correct? Yes. True implies false. That's not correct. False. False implies true. Yep, yeah, that's okay. True. True implies true is true. We have column three and column six being exactly the same. True, false, true, true. So these two properties must be exactly the same. P implies Q is the same as not Q implies not P. Two final pieces of notation, which we will be using later in calculus. The symbol for, for, for all is this upside down capital A. For all includes the letter A, and this is an upside down A. The symbol for there exists is this backwards E. Exists starts with the letter E, and this is a backwards E. Remember these because we'll be using these at the end of the course. The final chapter that I'm going to cover today is numbers. The set containing the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 
and seven, eight, nine, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is called the set of natural numbers. And we use the sim this symbol for natural numbers. This special n with a double vertical. These are the first numbers that children learn. When you're a small child, you go to and you're learning your numbers, you learn the counting numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six. For example, two is in the set N, because two is a natural number. Seven is in the set N, because seven is a natural number. A half is not in the set N, because a half is not a natural number. Zero is not in N, and negative numbers such as minus five are not in N. There is some disagreement around the world. Some in the world think that zero should be a natural number, but the majority, most mathematicians in the world agree that zero is not a natural number. So for the purpose of this course, we're going to follow what most people agree, and we're going to say that zero is not a natural number. Possible that a previous math teacher might have said zero is a natural number, but they were in a minority if they said that. In the natural numbers, we can do two operations. We can do addition and we can do multiplication. What I mean is, if I take two natural numbers, say two and seven, and I add them together, I still get a natural number nine. Or if I multiply two natural numbers together, two multiplied by seven, for example, and I always get a natural number. However, if we only have natural numbers, if that's all the numbers that we have, we can't do subtraction because, for example, two minus seven is not a natural number. So what do we do? We want to do more advanced mathematics, but we can't do subtraction. What do we do? We invent new numbers. The next set of numbers that we invent is the, the numbers called integers. The numbers, the natural numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and zero and the negative numbers, minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, etc. All of these numbers going bigger and smaller in each direction are called the set of integers. N we use for natural numbers. This Z symbol we use for the German word Zahlen. Now, in Z, we can do subtraction. We can do subtraction, addition, and multiplication. But we can't do division. For example, if I add two numbers together, three plus four, say, that's in Z, yeah. I could add three plus minus five, we're still in Z, that's fine. I can do subtraction, I can do multiplication. Multiply two integers together, we still have an integer. But what we can't do is we can't do division. For example, three divided by four is not an integer and three divided by minus five is not an integer. So what, did we, what did we do? What did humans do in our history when we got to this point? We invented new numbers. Next set I want to consider is the set of all of the fractions. What I mean is all of the things which look like A divided by B, where A and B are integers and B is not zero. This is the set of rational numbers. For this set, we use the special letter Q, which comes from the word quotient, which is another English word for fraction. Some examples. I could do 0 over 1, 100 over 13, 1 divided by 1, 3 divided by 4, etc. I could do 8 divided by minus 2 to get minus 4. I could do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 divided by 100,000 to get 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4, 5. These are all fractions, quotients, so these are all in Q. 
However, pi is not a rational number. It's not possible to write pi as a fraction. And the square root of 2 is not a rational number. It's not possible to write the square root of 2 as a fraction. Now, in Q, we can do addition, we can do subtraction, we can do multiplication, and we can do division, as long as we're dividing by a number which is not zero. So I ask the question, are we happy now? Do we have enough numbers to be able to do mathematics? And unfortunately, the answer is no. Why are we not happy? We're not happy because if we try to draw a picture of Q, if we draw all of the numbers in Q in a line, like this, we have this line, but it has lots and lots of holes in the line. For example, there's a hole just here at pi. Pi is 3.141592, etc. And for example, there's a hole at square root of 2. Square root of 2 is approximately 1.4. In fact, there are infinitely many holes in this. That means we're not happy. We don't have enough numbers to be able to do mathematics. So what do we do? What did humans do in our history? We invented new numbers. The set R is the set of real numbers. This is the set of all numbers which we can write as a decimal. For example, the number zero, which I could write as 0, 0.0, this is a real number. The number 23 divided by 99, I could write as 0 0.232323 recurring. This is, a, we can write this as a decimal, this is a real number. Three quarters is a real number. Pi, I could write as a real number. I could write as a decimal. Pi is a real number. In fact, all of these numbers which we think of like this are real numbers. The real numbers are complete. This is a technical term which means if we draw all of the real numbers in a line, then there's no holes in the line. Here is a picture of R, it's just a continuous line with no holes in it. So I ask you, are we happy now? Do we have enough numbers to be able to do the mathematics? And the answer to this question is yes. Now that we have the real numbers, now we can do the mathematics. And this is the end of today's lesson. Next week, and I'll tell you the sections in case you want to look ahead through the lecture notes. Next week, we're going to talk about intervals, about Cartesian coordinates, about functions, and sigma notation. This is the end of today's lesson. I'm now available to answer your questions. If you have questions, please type in chat.
Okay, the way that this works is we can use an hour for questions if you want, but when there are no more questions, we can end the lesson. That the time will be seven days, so there's, there's no timer. You can take your time as long as you finish before the deadline. So um, it will be available, the first one will be available Friday morning, and then seven days later, you need to have submitted your answer. Okay, I'm going to take a five minute break and then I'm going to come back to my computer to see if there are any more questions. If you don't have any questions, you're welcome to leave whenever you wish. If you think of a question later, please post a message in the on the discussion board and I'll answer your question there. <laughs> 